I want to see a few questions here. And we've got uh, mics here, but I want to ask a couple of questions that kind of came in and also some things I thought about. Uh, you talked, you know, tonight about tools and styles and, uh, you know, how, how they really get to removing the optical illusion that our code rocks, right? And I wanted you to talk a little bit about code readings because I think that's another approach, right? Uh, yeah, so... Um I'm a, a big advocate of code reading as a team building activity. Uh, code reading is usually thought of as a, uh, a bug discovery activity, and it, it does that too, but I think um, that's just sort of a, a nice side effect. The, the more valuable thing is getting a team together uh, uh, periodically and frequently to read each other's code um, in order to help um, the stronger programmers mentor the younger ones, um, to help identify uh, inconsistencies sooner. Also, for the younger ones to show the older guys some of the new techniques that are coming on that they might not be yeah. um, keeping track of. Um, I, it's not something you want to do with a dysfunctional team or with a bad manager, because you know, people tear themselves apart. But if, you, if everyone goes into it accepting that the goal is to uh, improve the quality of all of the programs for the mutual benefit of everybody on the team, and that everyone is uh, wanting to have the comments that people and improvements that can be suggested, it can be an extremely valuable thing. Yeah. We had uh, Nicholas Sackas, many of you know him, in the JavaScript world here for about six months. He and Nicole Sullivan consulting for us. And uh, Nicholas did a really good job with the code workshops and the code readings. I know the teams really enjoyed that, and I plan on getting you to, to start working with us on code readings within the team. I think we'll, we'll have a lot of fun with that. Uh, there, was a, there was a question that came in, uh, and I'm going to throw it to you since it was asked on the meetup, and it was basically your thoughts on the psychology of DCI, data, context, uh, interactivity versus, I guess, model view controller would be the, Yeah, the, so I'm not sure how you're going to handle that one, but I wanted to throw it to you anyway. Well, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not going to comment on the psychology of anything. Um, but DCI is sort of symptomatic of, of what goes on in, in uh, classical programming generally. That because classification is so difficult and, and taxonomy is so difficult, and that's basically the only model of code use in, in languages like Java, um, that community doesn't recognize how much pain it's in. Um, and there's this deep belief that model view controller is absolutely the one and only way of doing things, except it doesn't work. You know, reality keeps proving that it doesn't work. And so you, you keep looking for something that's just like model view controller that at least has an M and a V in it. Um, you know, my finding in JavaScript is you just don't mess with that crap. I mean, you've, you've got so many more options and it just gets lighter and easier. Um, so, uh, you know, trying to get free of that dogma is hard. Another question that came in through email, and then we'll, we'll get uh, going to the, to the crowd here. I'm sure they're anxious to ask questions. Is how much emotion or gut goes into choosing or gravitating towards a specific language? And maybe a couple of examples that you might. Uh, I know you're not a psychologist, but I'm asking you to diagnose a little bit here. Um, well, just you look at the, you know, so we imagine ourselves to be the most rational people in the world, right? Because the computer is completely unforgiving, and it is totally 100% rational. So you can't bullshit a computer, right? It, you you got to give it to it straight, and that that discipline, you know, affects us. You know, it's it's why we have no social skills, you know. And, <laughs> and so we have, we imagine it makes us, you know. That, that we are super rational beings, but you look at the things that we choose to argue about and how deeply held those beliefs are and, and all of the, uh, the biases that we bring to this stuff, and we are far, far from rational. So, you know, the emotional side of this seems to carry quite a lot of our, our activity and our professional choices. Cool. All right, I'm going to do one raffle here, and uh, it's actually animated too, which is a really cool feature. So I'm going to hit the button, spins. 209. Oh. Anybody got 209? All right, going once, going twice. Here we go. 435. We have a winner? Awesome. 
Can we get a, Amanda, maybe we can get a book over here to the, the winner? Awesome, great. We'll do another in a minute. So when I open up the questions, we have mics on both sides here. Bill, I uh, just wanted up. to yeah. mention yep. the, the hashtag on Twitter is TechX, if anyone wants to ask a question. Yes, hashtag on Twitter, TechX, T-E-C-H-X. Easy to do, easy to remember. Uh, so I've often had the feeling that JavaScript becomes difficult in a team environment because when you're reviewing the code, you don't have type declarations or type safety, so it becomes difficult to tell what code is really doing because you don't know what its inputs are and what its outputs are. Just curious to hear what your feelings would on, on that would be. Um, I think if you're coming from a, uh, a Java tradition, then yeah, um, because that, that was what you used to use to keep yourself honest. Um, you don't have type checking available to you in JavaScript. Um, so you need to uh, come up with it in other ways. You have to um, uh, be clearer in your documentation and, and in your practices. So it's a different set of trade-offs. Um, you know, should JavaScript had, should it have had type checking? I think that would actually have made it a more difficult language for the beginners. And its accessibility to the beginners had a lot to do with why it became so successful. And I'm finding an increasingly large set of programs that are so much easier to write without classes. Um, you know, just being able to dynamically gen up an object that contains exactly what you need at, at the instant. Um, you know, so I, I used to be a, a, um, a strong type checking guy. Um, I, I worshiped at that church every week, and I thought that's just the way it should be. And I, was, I felt very uneasy in JavaScript for that reason. But eventually, working with it long enough, I started to realize, wow, this is actually better. Because one of the promises of, of strong type checking is that there's a large class of errors that get caught automatically. And the more errors you can catch early, the cheaper everything is. And that's true, and that's good. But I found that those sorts of errors were the things that I found almost immediately in my testing. And that, the really, that there's an even larger class of errors that type checking doesn't help you with. And so the amount of testing I have to do is about the same. So um, having strong uh, type safety um, doesn't seem to work, at least not as Java specifies it. In languages like um, ML um, and Scala, you know, which have, I think, more rational type systems, there may be a better benefit. And there some people who say in ML or in Haskell, if you can get your program past the type checker, it's probably right. It, it turns out even that's not true. You know, so there are uh, testing frameworks in Haskell because even there, uh, type checking doesn't catch everything. There, there are more errors than there are with types. One more question. We have, we have one over here. So Google is uh, talking about uh, introducing a language called Dart. And uh, I was wondering what you thought of that and what the odds are. It seems like languages uh, need to be available on the platform and culture. The popularity and the availability of libraries seems to trump everything. So what are the odds of something new coming along that would work? like uh, b become as popular as JavaScript or, or Dart being successful at all? I think it would be really sad, profoundly, deeply sad, if JavaScript was the last programming language. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I eagerly await its replacement. You know, uh, there are times when I despair at the web, like, God, we got so much wrong and we seem to be stuck with it. I hope we're not stuck with it forever. I hope we can finally figure out a way to move off of some of this stuff. Um, Oh, there are lots of good languages. And, and right now we're in this language renaissance where we're seeing lots of new languages, you know, and, and a bunch of them are coming out of Google. Another language coming out of Google is Go, which I, I like a lot more, although it's not an application language. Um, there's a lot about Go, which is really, really nice. Um, so I, I don't think Dart is the language to replace JavaScript. I, I don't know what that language is yet. I, I haven't seen it. Um, but, you know, we'll see where that goes. I have the mic, so I guess I get to ask. Uh, and this kind of dovetails into that question. So there, uh, I've been reading recently quite a bit that 
there's been this uh, perception that JavaScript will become the assembly of the internet. And there have been people that have argued to say that there should be some constructs ad added back to the language, such as go-tos, to facilitate other languages to compile into JavaScript uh, and make it more accessible to connoisseurs of other languages, C-sharp, Java, et cetera. Uh, this, it's a total opinion question. What is your opinion of, uh, one, adding constructs to JavaScript to make it more of an assembly, like destination language, uh, and just in general, the perception of other languages compiling to JavaScript? Yeah, so that is a huge surprise, that, that JavaScript is becoming a compilation target, that people are translating other languages to JavaScript. Our thinking had been for a long time that the uh, universal virtual machine of the internet was going to be the Java VM. And it turns out to be JavaScript. Um, who would have thought, you know? It, it's there, it works. Google is, is compiling Java into JavaScript so it will run everywhere, um, which is amazing. So there's a lot of pressure on JavaScript now to become a better compilation target, to make it easier. For example, there's a limited set of control structures in JavaScript, you know, while, do, for. Um, and if you're trying to move a language that doesn't exactly map onto those structures, it's really hard. Um, and so there's been clamoring for adding GoTo to the language. Now, it took us a generation to get rid of GoTo. You know, after Dijkstra, you know, before we argued about uh, where the curly braces go, we used to argue about should you be using GoTo or not. And it li literally took a generation before we got rid of it. Um, if we put it back in, some asshole web developer is going to say, wow, I bet your programs go a lot faster if you use GoTo, and they'll put it on his blog, and pretty soon guys will be writing GoTo's without semicolons. And <laughs> And Is that the exhibitionist or the thrill seeker? Yeah, and then it'll take us another generation to get rid of it. So we definitely don't want to add Go to the language because the first responsibility is to promote good practice in the web, and so we got to do that. There's a good alternative, though. There's a thing called tail recursion, where if the last thing a function does is return the value of calling another function, there's a, a wonderful optimization there where you can change the... Uh, subroutine call return pair with a go-to. So it becomes a form of go-to, which allows for continuation passing and a bunch of higher order functional programming, which is wonderful and brilliant, and which will allow the compiler writers to use that as a form of go-to for getting more efficient code. So uh, that's a feature which I expect will be in ES6, um, and you know, so that's how we get that. I've seen demand for other things like integer types. Um, and the reason they want integers is there's this appalling error that happens with integers that if you put a number that's too big in it, then it wraps around and becomes hugely negative, which is insane that anyone would want that. And the reason they want it in JavaScript is so that they can take C-sharp programs and preserve the errors that those programs create. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so... You know, I, I, I doubt that we're going to get that in JavaScript. It, it's actually good in JavaScript that we have one number type. That it, the only problem is we got the wrong one. So I have a, a question. Um, we use a lot of the software patterns in Java or C++, lots of languages. I'm just wondering, do you use uh, some patterns in JavaScript? Um, of course we use patterns, um, but not the patterns that you see in the Gang of Four book. Um, I read the Gang of Four book looking to see how I could apply those patterns to JavaScript. And it turned out most of them were unnecessary. It looked like those patterns were designed to overcome limitations of the classical model. And in JavaScript, if you're thinking functionally, if you're thinking prototypally, those are not problems that you have. You'll have different problems, maybe more interesting problems, but not those. Hi. How you doing? Um, What's your opinion on hot code paths and the trade-off between performance and easier to read code? Let's say um, you have to execute a function every 33 milliseconds and you could call math.floor or use a bitwise operator to floor in a number uh, and the trade-off there. You really have that critical 
<laughs> in JavaScript? Yeah, actually I do. <laughs> wow, it, if you have to do terrible things, then you have to. Um, it, <laughs> You, you, right. you know, you just hope that you don't, you know, you. and try to find a way not to. But if you have to do the bad thing, then what else can you do? Comment it really well. Say, yeah, I know I'm doing a bad thing. <laughs> and say, kids, don't do this because I know I'm doing a bad thing here. He has a similar problem to what we had at Netflix where he's trying to use the browser for some game development. So. Uh, that's, that's, I have to know a little bit about this, so yeah, it's, it's tr problematic. Yeah. You know, so in, in the long term, you're, you're probably going to regret doing what you're doing. Maybe you already <laughs> regret it now. Well, no, just that things keep going faster and the performance uh, profiles keep changing. So things that are slow in one version turn out to go really fast unexpectedly in another. And sometimes the things that you're doing as the workaround become the slow path. Um, so, you know, stupid tricks are not forever. So uh, one other note is that on the Meetup site, there's a poll. So please, when you go home later, uh, fill out the poll on the Meetup site. Thank you. Next question. Um, I have a question about. Um, hello. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a question about the uh, ECMAScript Harmony, actually. So uh -huh. I've been hearing like really good suggestions. And last year, you you told us that you were actually a part of a committee. And could you get me some tidbits about what are the interesting parts that have you know, being suggested will be adopted, and what should we look forward as developers to adopt it in our code to make it more efficient and on awesome? Yeah, I wish I could tell you what's going to be in the sixth edition. I'm really not sure. There are a few things that I know. You know if, if all we got in the next edition were tail recursion and modules, I'd say we did a damn good job. But unfortunately, we're going to have a lot more in there than that. Um, and some of it's going to be really good stuff and some of it is going to be bad parts. And it's too hard to tell right now which they're going to be. Uh, every feature that we're looking at looks great, but we have not taken a hard enough look yet at how all that stuff is going to interact. Um, and we need to do that soon, and we haven't started that process yet. Um, when we do, I expect we'll start winnowing stuff out or trying to coalesce a, a number of things into one or defer more things to the next edition. Um, so at this point, I'm not confident in predicting what the next edition will have in it. I am happy to report that the committee is still harmonious. Um, prior to being harmonious, we were not, and that was really unpleasant. Um, so harmony is definitely a much better way to be working. Uh, quick quick, quick uh, question. I, uh, most of the devices now that are running JavaScript have at least two processors. One is a GPU and one is a CPU, and many of them have multiple CPUs, maybe multiple GPUs. And um, so we see a little bit of parallelism maybe on the coming up with WebCL, but I'm just wondering if you ever think that there will be, I don't know, maybe multiple processes across divs or something like that. Is there going to be any option for parallelism in JavaScript, do you think? Uh, yeah. So um, Intel has been doing some really interesting work where they've got um, a thing that they call a parallel array, which you can construct from a normal array. Um, and then you can... Um, apply something that looks like a JavaScript function to that parallel array, and it will distribute it to all the cores. Um, so um, I don't think that'll get into the sixth edition. It might make it into some future edition. Well, I want to really thank Doug you know, tonight, and uh, let's all give Doug a big hand. <laughs> <laughs>